What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football channel. As always, it's your boy, Nick, here to break down the numbers. Got into the Patriots team outlook last time. Today, we're gonna continue to the AFC East, and we're getting into the Miami Dolphins. A lot of chatter this offseason about the Dolphins. A lot of rumors, a lot of reports. Should be some good stuff. A lot of stats, analysis, and nonsense. As always, let's get into it. So, we got Ryan Tannehill at quarterback still, the wide receiver converted quarterback from Texas A&M. Only played in 13 games last year. His season ended after a minor ACL tear in week 13. Nothing major. He's already fully healthy, ready to go for this next year. Um, but his progression as a quarterback and as a passer has kind of slowed down since 2014 when he had that 27 touchdown season. Over the last two years, he's ranked as QB 22 and QB 25 on a fantasy points per game basis. So low end QB two, if not QB three numbers. Uh, right now he's being picked at quarterback 20, which is probably about right. What does it mean for next year? They brought in Julius Thomas, which would be a nice red zone target for him. A lot of hype around Devontae Parker, kind of progressing as a player. So, you know, these could light a spark in Tannehill. I don't really see it happening. Going into his second year in Adam Gase's offense, the continuity is gonna be nice. But if you look at their offense as a whole, right, they averaged over 36 pass attempts in 2013, 2014, and 2015. Last year, as soon as, you know, as they found their guy in Jay Ajayi, someone who's gonna be able to handle the load in the backfield, that number dropped from 36 down to 29.8 or something, under 30. So a huge dip in volume from a passing perspective. They rank six in the NFL in terms of percentage of their plays being rush. So 44.5% of their offensive plays were rushing plays, which is six in the NFL. Also, the coaches are talking about how they want Tannehill to run less after that ACL tear, which is obviously a downside because that's a big part of his fantasy production would come from running. I mean, he's not a crazy rusher. He's not a scrambler or anything, but he definitely adds like 200, 300 yards on the season. A couple of touchdowns because he has that mobility, right? He's an athlete kind of guy. So they take that out of his game. It's a little less upside. So I think, you know, you, you match the run heavy approach that they're going to use in 2017. Tannehill just lacking progression. It's very, 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 very poor under pressure. Combine that with a bad offensive line. It's not a good upside play for Tannehill there. QB 20, I find myself taking guys like Carson Palmer and Sam Bradford ahead of him. And those are guys that are going around the same pick the same area. So I'm kind of off on Tannehill this year. So you look at who's been his most consistent weapon over the last few years, right? It's un undoubtedly Jarvis Landry. Wide receiver 13 last year in PPR, wide receiver 10 in 2015 PPR. Right now he's going 35th overall as wide receiver 18. So you're like, oh, what's the gap there for? You think, you know, does he deserves more, right? He deserves more credit. He deserves a higher draft pick. His floor is there. He's always a PPR monster. I don't think that's the case. I think he's being drafted around the right spot, if not maybe even a little higher. So he's averaged 149 targets over the last two seasons. He's had double digit targets in 17 of those 32 games. The problem with taking the averages is that he had 166 targets in 2015 and only 131 last year. So you see a huge decrease in that target total. So the red flags come from a few different things. Firstly, if you're a Devonta Parker fanboy, I'm not, I don't see like a huge breakout by any means, but you'd have to think that his progression and his usage in this offense goes up, which means the passing volume as a whole is gonna go down, but Parker's target numbers should go up, which takes away from Landry, of course. Secondly is just the usage of J.H.I. Jay and how much they did use him last year. You look at the start of the season for the Dolphins, Landry had double digit touchdown, uh, double digit targets. So 10 or more targets in the first four games, every single one of those games for them last year. As soon as Ajayi took over that starting role in week five, he only had two double digit target games for the rest of the year. So in those next 12 games, he only had two compared to the four he had in the first four weeks. His usage just goes down a lot. His receiving yards per game, his targets, his receptions, all dropped as soon as Jay Ajayi got there and started really producing for them. So as per Evan Silva, Despite playing 74 more snaps in 2016 than 2015, Landry lost a whopping 35 targets off his previous year's total. So he did, he played 75 more snaps and still dropped 35 targets. Huge red flag there. And I think it's a trend that could definitely stick in 2017. I guess the addition of Julius Thomas, you know, catching balls over the middle doesn't, 
doesn't help him either. I don't think it's going to play a huge role in this, but it's definitely not a positive. So he's still going to be a good PPR play. He catches a ton of balls, even with a lower target total. But despite that, he doesn't score touchdowns. Hasn't eclipsed five touchdowns in any of his three seasons. And it, I mean, it would be stupid to just expect an outlier every year in 2017. It just doesn't make sense. What is odd to me though is, uh, let me read this off. Landry saw 14 targets inside the opponent's 10 yard line in 2015. So 14, which is a ton, probably top five or top 10 in the league at least. But he only had two of those targets last year. But he caught the same number of touchdowns in both seasons. I mean, he had four of those targets in 2014. So it was four, 10, two last year. And when you look at the numbers overall, right, his career percentage of targets that come inside the 10 yard line is 5%. Last year, it was only one, only 1.6% 1 of his targets were inside the 10 yard line. So, you know, if, if he does see that high number of target, target totals again this year, if it's 120, even if it dips down 120 to 130, 5% of that would still give him six, seven, eight targets inside the 10 yard line. Still plenty of room for a higher touchdown total than the four or five, you know, something around that range. So I'm not too nervous about that number dipping overall. There's just a lot of red flags. So I'm not reaching up to get Landry because I think he's a safe play because he's actually not that safe. And next up, you got Devontae Parker, obviously. 24 years old, first round pick, highly touted. The hype's getting kind of out of control. Um, he, took a, he took a pretty quiet leap forward last year in his sophomore season. 56 catches, 744 yards, four touchdowns. That's leaving him with an ADP of, let me see, 72 overall wide receiver, 34. You don't have to pay a huge price, but you're still get, picking him around other good wide receivers, so it is a risk. We've been hearing just ridiculous reports all offseason, just as the Miami team as a whole, which is pissing me the fudge off, but about Parker. They're stating he's healthy and hungry, and the Dolphins are looking for a gigantic season from him. He's ready to take a giant leap. Multiple sources told the Miami Herald that Devontae Parker has been so impressive this offseason that Dolphins coaches are now hopeful he can finally develop into a dominant threat. Every time I did that, it was a quote from some asshole beat reporter, in case you didn't know. Like, what else are you going to say about your players? Oh, no, I think he's going to have a terrible year. I think he's going to be shitty. No, he's not going to have a breakout. He sucks. Obviously, they're going to be touting that stuff all offseason. People love Parker because coming out, he, he's an elite raw talent, right? Really long, really long arms. He looks like A.J. Green, if, if not a little more muscle on his frame. So I understand, you know, he's got that high speed, like really good 40 speed for an outside threat. All that gibberish aside, I think it's a, it's a safe bet to, that he takes a step forward again in terms of statistics. But it's still a low, low volume passing offense, right? I could see him finishing between 60 and 65 catches. 850 to 900 yards and then anywhere from like six to eight touchdowns depending on how they utilize him in the red zone because he has that tall target really long arms he could probably catch the fade ball but julius thomas is also there now i think he could definitely finish in that wider th wide receiver three high-end wide receiver three conversation i don't think he's gonna finish inside the top 15 or the top 20 or anything like that but he he very well could end up as the second most valuable fantasy asset on this team behind jay jay this year wouldn't really surprise me then we'll move on to kenny stills i mean i don't dude i don't know i feel like i'm in the minority here i guess but i, I like i find it so hard to understand the contract that he got this offseason four years 32 million 20 million guaranteed i mean i get why they gave it to him he's 25 years old scored nine touchdowns last year huge number definitely an outlier but like He's averaged under 45 receiving yards per game over his entire career. Under 45 receiving yards, that's like, what, what part of that says $32 million, here you go, sir. He's never finished above wide receiver 39 in PPR leagues. Um, on average, it's wide receiver 55 is finish. To me, he's just a deep threat with limited opportunity in this offense, not gonna get red zone looks, rushing the ball a ton. You know, there's just not a lot of opportunity for him there. He will get those deep ball looks again, but Tannehill's not an accurate deep ball thrower. So he won't be on like any of my teams in 2017, despite his ADP of 166 wide receiver 55. And then you get to Julius Thomas, moving teams in Florida. Comes over from Jacksonville to Miami, where he reunites with Adam Gase, right? And you've probably heard the storyline by this point in the off season. He played with Adam Gase as the OC in Denver when they had those incredible years. He scored 24 touchdowns in just 27 games. It was the course of 2013 and 2014. So I get what the hype is about. You also have to remember that that was the Peyton Manning led team that might've been the best offense of the last 20 years. Like you're not coming into that offense again. 
you will get nowhere near the opportunity that you had there. So these beat reporters that keep saying 10 touchdowns is a strong possibility are out of their fucking minds. In Gase's offense last season with Tannehill, he only attempted 14 passes inside the 10-yard line. Manning averaged 52 of those per season when Thomas was there. So the opportunity is just out of control, not in Thomas's favor. I do think that, you know, the reports of them heavily utilizing him is a good thing. If you're looking for Julius Thomas on your team, they will be drawing up plays in, in on the goal line for him. So if nothing else, they're going to be forcing passes to him there. I would say that his touchdown over under total is probably six and a half. Wouldn't shock me to see him score seven touchdowns, six or seven touchdowns. So that's Pretty good for a tight end, especially when you're drafting late. He's going off the board at tight end 16 right now. He's got that high upside, a touchdown total. I find myself drafting him a lot as my tight end too in the play draft leagues, given his you know his week to week touchdown upside. <clears throat> we'll move on to Jay Jai. My sweetheart, my darling. I love me some Jay Jai this year. I absolutely think he is the fully featured back in the Dolphins offense this year. Uh, again, they had the sixth highest percentage of their plays were runs. Would expect that to continue. We don't have to get into the three separate 200 yard games he had last year. That's not a fluke. Once, maybe. Twice, maybe. Three different times though. Don't at me. From week six on last season when Ajayi fully took over that workhorse horse roll on the Stallion, he didn't have a single game under 16 touches. Adam Gase has been coming out saying he's going to give him 350 rushing attempts this year, possibly. If he could stay healthy and play all 16 games, I think it's a ridiculous total. But uh, he did average 20.9 carries a game from week six on, which if you prorate that out to 16 games, it's 334 carries. The big if there, staying healthy, being able to handle that workload. If Gase says that he wants to do that, then why not? They saw the rushing attack work well for them last year. Two concerns most people have, I guess, for Ajayi are, you know, the lack of receiving opportunity and the poor offensive line. I'll say to the receiving portion of that, the Dolphins offensive coordinator, I think his name's Clyde, Clyde Christensen. Yeah, Clyde Christensen came out and said that Ajayi's receiving skills are 200% better right now than they were at this time last year, which is obviously a good, a good sign of his improvement and working hard in the offseason. You look back at him at Boise State, right? His last year there, he caught 50 passes in a season. So he he was like by no means not a good pass catcher. Like he proved in college that he could do that part of the game. He just needs the opportunity, which I think is easily there for him. As far as the offensive line goes, I have no argument there. They suck. They're gonna suck. They're gonna continue to be poor. But I think the amount of volume that JJ is gonna see should outweigh that. And I know a lot of people are gonna say, what's the difference between JJ and Todd Gurley? One. Miami is a much better offense. They score a lot more. They average, I think, 10 points more per game than the Rams did last year. They were 17th in scoring. So at worst, this Dolphins team, given the continuity of the offense, given the step forward in terms of weapons and, and, and the steps that they're taking, at worst, they're going to be the 17th scoring offense in the NFL again. At best, they improve a few spots, right? The scoring opportunities are going to be much more plentiful in Miami than they are in I get Los Angeles now. Second, I see a lot of Gurley losing receiving work. They signed Lance Dunbar there, who is a receiving back. In Miami, J.H.I. looks like he's going to be the complete three-down workhorse there. That's just what I have to say about that. So right now he's going pick 14, running back seven, which is perfectly fine by me. I have him ranked as my seventh running back off the board. To me, he's in the same tier. He, well, he Maybe he's not in the same tier, but he's right up there with Devonta, Melvin Gordon, LaShawn McCoy. And then him and DeMarco Murray are like right knocking on that door to get in that tier. So I love him there. Uh, easily take him above Jordan Howard. And I, finally, the fantasy community's kind of come around to that. And you see Howard's uh, ADP separating himself a little bit. You know, they don't have much else in the backfield. They have Damian Williams, who enters his fourth NFL season. He has yet to get 15, 58 touches in a season. So I'm almost more inclined to say that Kenyon Drake is the handcuff here, even though they don't have a handcuff in this backfield. I think this passing game is going to get less volume. I think JHI is going to be an absolute stud this year. That's how I feel about the Miami Dolphins in 2017. Thank you for sticking around. If you enjoyed the video, please just give it that thumbs up down there. Scroll down a little bit and just do that for me. I appreciate you guys spending your time with my face on your screen. Go follow me on Twitter if you'd like. Go check out the blog, the shop, all that good stuff. And I will see you next time with the New York Jets gangrene team outlook. Peace out, players.